fangen wir an äh, um die Alana Präsentation. Jetzt äh, hoffe ich, dass äh, Mr. Fahrrad äh, Abersoft da ist. Ah, wir haben ihn schon. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. And you? Good. Good, good, thank you. Perfect. Um, so I will change to your presentation. I was trying hard to understand what you were saying in German, but the, <laughs> the charts helped a lot. <laughs> I, I hope you, your chart Our will help us uh, a lot too. No, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm making in the introduction, I'm, I'm making the introduction that you searching or you explore for potash. Potash is in, in Germany or German speaking area well known. Um, Italian Salz is one of the biggest producer or maybe the big I don't know uh, but maybe you can explain us um, and um, uh, with uh, the takeover from Kalian Sars pot from Potash One so a lot of people looking at the Potash uh, stocks and um, I tell before Helmut when we, we meet us a few minutes before we, we start the conference that uh, one news magazine in Austria right up you uh, the, the Kevin Magazine write a small article about you, about the exploration, potash, and, and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, some people are really interested in this potash area, and uh, so hopefully you can explain a little bit more about um, uh, the, your, your company, and especially maybe also to a general uh, overview about the potash market. Sorry for a second, I will explain a little bit uh, for this for the uh, people that are here. Um, also Alana Potash is Moch um, Kalium, uh, is a company that in Africa um, tätig is. Um, in Ethiopian show. Ethiopian, sorry, ja, Ethiopian. But this kriegen wir jetzt alles noch mit. Uh, und, um, Potash ist ein bisschen in, in Fokus auch bei uns gekommen, weil Kali und Salz ja einer der größten Hersteller ist auf der Welt. Und Kali und Salz hat auch äh, im, im letzten Jahr, im Zuhörer, glaube ich, letztes Jahr, die Potash One übernommen hat. Und somit auch äh, ähm, die ganzen Potash Explorer in den Fokus kommen sind von den größeren. Es hat dann auch ähm, ein Bitte gegeben von BHP für Potash One und Kali und Salz hat es gewonnen. Also von daher ist es dieser Markt relativ. Interessant, der österreichische Magazin hat das auch jetzt gerade ab, äh, aufgenommen, die Akte. Und so können wir jetzt gespannt sein, was uns ähm, ja, der Mr. Fahrrad uns präsentiert über Alana. So, please, it's your stage. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Helmut. <coughs> it's my pleasure to be on this webcast. Uh, well, as you explained, this is a very interesting, very unique potash project in Ethiopia, in northeastern part of Africa. And I'll go briefly through the presentation. Obviously, feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. But I'll try to explain uh, the, the key benefits or key advantages uh, our project has over uh, existing uh, potash exploration projects worldwide. And uh, you will see that this is really uniquely positioned to be one of the low-cost operators in the world, as well as, uh, you know, to be, uh, it's in a great position to go to production in about three to four years from now. Okay, uh, maybe I uh, translate a little bit. Sure. Um, also, they in Ethiopian, they sind, uh, ein, oder sie gehen davon aus, dass sie in drei, vier Jahren in Produktion sein uh, können. Uh, sie sind, uh, und er wird uns erklären, warum eigentlich jetzt das so ein uh, 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 besonderes Projekt ist. Und ja, yeah. okay, this was really short and quick translation. So, that's <laughs> okay, good. that's good. And I, I'm not going to, um, you know, talk about the sector in general. Maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sure Joe, your, yourself, Helmut, and others will have questions, and that's when I will answer those. But I will focus on the project in this particular presentation. Um, the, you know, you can see from this slide that uh, we are the only Ponash uh, junior company in the world right now that have two very solid, strong strategic partners, International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group, of course, as you know, and a very large private equity uh, fund out of the United States called Liberty Metals and Mining, which is a part of Liberty Mutual Insurance Group out of Boston. And uh, if you want to go ahead, Joe. Uh, yep. Um, I said, 
Was das Projekt wirklich so besonders macht, ist, dass äh, von, auf der Finanzierungsseite zwei große ähm, Finanzierungsgruppen <lacht> dabei ist. Auf der einen Seite die International Finance Corp, das ist ein Teil der Weltbank, und dann die Liberty Metals and Mining, das ist ein, ein privater Hedgefonds äh, aus, äh, aus den USA, und die finanzieren eigentlich die Company. Okay. A lot of potash projects in the world uh, are very deep. Uh, as you know, the, the major producers in the world are in, in Saskatchewan, in Canada, in Russia, as you know, Kalian Sult, uh, Salts in, in Germany, and there are quite a few others. And most of these projects, uh, most of these deposits are very deep. We're talking about 600 meters down to all the way to 2,000 meters in some areas of Saskatchewan. Our project in Ethiopia is very unique that it's one of the most shallow depth deposits in the world. It's only about 100 and to 300 meters deep, which means that you can do, of course, any kind of extraction methodology, any kind of mining here. You can do underground, as you know, but it's the most expensive way. Most importantly, you can do solution mining. And it's also unique that this is the only um, the region in the world where you could potentially do an open pit mining for, uh, for potash, which is impossible anywhere else in the world. Okay. Okay, that's, um, that's quite interesting. Um, Normalerweise sind diese ganzen Kaliumprojekte äh, sehr tief, also zwischen 600 und 2000 Meter, also die sind in Saskatchewan oder auch für Kali und Salz und in Russland. Ähm, ihr Projekt ist sehr oberflächennah, also nur 100 bis 300 Meter und es gibt ihnen alle Möglichkeiten vom, vom Mining. Wenn sie jetzt Underground Mining machen, also unser Tagebergbau, dann ist der in der Regel sehr, sehr teuer. Ähm, was alle anderen machen müssen, bei ihnen ist es sogar möglich, eben, dass sie Open Pit machen oder eben Solution Mining. Solution Mining wird auch dann wahrscheinlich umgesetzt in Saskatchewan. Um, okay, um, yep. that, that uh, means normally, normally that um, yes. uh, when you uh, build a mine, uh, uh, that, that the capex costs are really high as a, as a potash company. Um, can you compare this a little bit to, to some other uh, companies? Say, okay, normally uh, a mine costs, underground mine costs, uh, a potash mine costs two, three billion, and ours maybe costs two, I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, much lower than that, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so that's a very good point. Uh, actually, you know, if you take an, a typical underground potash mine in Saskatchewan, or, or let's say in Russia or in Germany, <clears throat> for that matter, it would cost you for a million ton a year, it would cost some, somewhere between two and three billion dollars to build mm -hmm. it. Um, so very expensive. Mm -hmm. Now if you take a solution mine, again let's say if it's Saskatchewan, it will cost uh, a substantial less, or probably between a uh, billion and a two and two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, now because in solution mining obviously you don't have to uh, build a shaft, you don't have to sink a shaft, uh, you don't have mm -hmm. to go underground, etc. You just drill and um, uh, uh, dissolve potash underground. Now, in the case of Ethiopia, because it's shallow depth, uh, we estimate that the, the cost is going to be actually a half of what we have in Saskatchewan. It's going to be below $1 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nur zur Übersetzung, also normalerweise Untergrund mindestens zwischen 2 und 3 uh, Milliarden. Um, eine normale. Um, wenn man jetzt auf Solution geht, wie es in Saskatchewan ist, kostet zwischen 1 und 2 Milliarden. Sie gehen davon aus, dass Ihre Kapexkosten dadurch, dass die so oberflächennah sind, dieses, äh, diese, äh, diese Kosten halbieren können von der Solution Mine. Um, that's mean um, between 501 and 1 billion, you think? That's correct. And um, um, we'll, we'll get yeah. a better, uh, better number later on this year when we start the bankable feasibility study. Okay, okay. Um, but coming uh, to, to this point, uh, so okay, I, I go a little bit further the, the road, but uh, sure. uh, normally as an exploration company, the most of them coming and say, okay, my major target is to get take over by a big company. Is it your now to say, okay, maybe I bring it into production by myself or to you looking for, for a takeover from, from other companies? So uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question for many uh, potash companies, uh, there's only one exit strategy or one option, and that's to, to sell the company to a bigger player. And you've seen that in Saskatchewan, uh, the most recently potash one got sold. Uh, before that, there were a couple of other companies that were bought by BHP Billiton. Uh, and the reason for that is clear. There, it's extremely difficult for a small junior company to raise $2 billion or more to build a uh, potash mine. 
In our case, we're in a unique situation where obviously we can always sell the company if there is a substantial premium and if it makes sense uh, value-wise. But the key benefit uh, of this, or a key uh, advantage of this uh, asset is that we can also take it to production on our own. In other words, it's, it's, although it's, it's a large number still, it's going to be several hundred million dollars to build it, but it can be done using both equity and debt. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not in a situation uh, that many Saskatchewan-based junior companies face where they have to find a buyer. We don't. Uh, we, we can actually take this to production, and that's what we've been planning. Okay. And, and you talked this about with your two major finance uh, group, uh, this, this uh, positive, uh, may, maybe this, this idea to maybe bring it by itself in production or to take over one? Well, that, that's exactly right. The, the reason that we brought these two major uh, financial partners uh, to the table was that we wanted to take it to production. If, if for example, we wanted just to, to do what the others do, meaning that you know you develop it, you, you explore it, you prove up the resource, and you sell it, you don't really need international finance corporation for that. You don't really need a large organization like Liberty Metals and Mining because, as you know, most of the money that you can that you can raise here in Toronto. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars just to do the exploration. But we brought these uh, major organizations to, to Atlanta in order to support us not only now at this stage of our uh, development, but most importantly at the construction stage. Okay. So, so that's, that's the main driver there. That, that's the uh, purpose of these two organizations uh, being in the partnership with us. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. It's um, a few questions. Please go ahead in, in, in your presentation yeah sure um, so we, we've drilled uh, uh, 20 holes now and most of these holes have hit potash uh, most of them at shallow depth which is again proving up uh, what we've been thinking about this uh, area right from the beginning and, and you will see later on in the presentation that the, um, the, the grades have been excellent they were all, all the way up to 52 percent this is a bit older presentation we just put out another, another news release uh, where we hit potash uh, reaching 52 percent KCL uh, these are very, very high grades. These are probably the highest grades in the world. I mean, the, one of the highest, I should say. Very comparable to uh, the best potash areas in the uh, in the world, uh, in Saskatchewan, in, in Russia, and so forth. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're planning to start the bankable feasibility study later this year, but before that, uh, we've engaged, a, in fact, German company, airport based company called Aircus Plan. Uh, to do our 43101 technical resource report, and we expect it to be ready by the end of this month um, uh, and early June. So, in two, three weeks, hopefully, we'll have the draft and we'll be able to announce to the market uh, you know, initial, um, initial resource number uh, after the 21 hole or 20 holes that have been drilled. Now, I just want to uh, say one thing the most of these holes have been drilled in the west side. Uh, which we believe already have proven a very large resource. We haven't done a lot of work on the east side. We've only drilled two holes. In fact, we've drilled on one hole and the other one is being drilled now, which means that 43101 will be just on the west side, most likely, and then we'll have another 40% of the property that will be added later on this year. To okay, the let me side. translate a little bit. Um, sure. The 22 Vorläufe geboren. Und es wurden durchschnittlich 47% Kaliumchlorid gefunden, wobei nach der neuesten ähm, Pressemeldung ist durchschnittlich 52% schon sind. Ähm, in ein paar Wochen wird äh, eine neue 43101-Studie veröffentlicht von einem deutschen ähm, ja, geologischen Institut. Unabhängigen Unternehmen. Unabhängigen deutschen Geologischen Institut. <lacht> Und. Ähm, Es ist auch so, dass diese 20 Vorläufe großteils an der Westseite und noch nicht an der Ostseite gebohrt worden sind und so dort schon eine große Lagerstätte definiert worden ist, aber ähm, es ist alles großteils auf der Westseite und noch nicht auf der Ostseite. So a, a small question from me, what, what are usually the grades for, 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 for Kali in, in other mines, compared to other mines? It will range between uh, 20 and 35 percent. Okay, so are you a really, really high grade? Yes. Uh, now I have to uh, explain that, that not all of it, of course, is 47 percent. There is also 30 percent, 25 percent. But we also have the upper part of our 
uh, potash bearing beds, which is sylvanite, which reaches between 40 and 52 percent, which is absolutely right, uh, very high. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Okay, durchschnittlich haben solche Minen zwischen 20 und 25, vielleicht 30 Prozent. Die haben bis zu 53 Prozent. Und uh, das zeigt eigentlich dann, wie groß das ist. Okay, please, go okay. ahead. So, so we believe, uh, uh, you know, because of that, we're going to probably be one of the lowest cost operators in the world. And one other advantage that I want to bring uh, to your attention here is the fact that um, because of Ethiopia's uh, location, we will probably end up being the nearest supplier to India. And India um, is the second largest importer of potash after China. So it's a very important potash market uh, in the world. Okay. Uh, please let me uh, short explain. Yep, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> yep. sind, um, ganz nah from Indien and um, Indien is the größte, oh no, no, the zweitgrößte um, potash importer, the größte is Bi. And with these hohen Gehalten and the Oberflächen and so on, they are one of the, they are one of the, um, ein potenzieller ha Hauptlieferant, ne? oder? Ja, ja, Hauptlieferant und vor allem auch der, der über die niedrigsten Kosten hat. Um, jo. You, you tell me a little bit about the, the market. So India is the second largest importer. Uh, China is the, the, the largest one. Um, maybe can you explain how big is the market itself? So that um, yeah. we, we get a feeling from how big is really the market and, and what's, what's uh, yeah. And yeah, the, 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 the only reason why I was, uh, was yeah. a little bit Go nervous make me is we have a lot of potential potash um, um, exploration companies. Uh, is it not, not possible that when a lot of potash mines go in production that maybe the price of potash coming down? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got, uh, yeah, that's a very good question, Joe. They, uh, the, uh, maybe I can give you a, lead, a little bit of an overview of how uh, the, the sector has been operating and what the dynamics is. Um, the, the whole sector produces about 52 million tons of potash uh, right now. And about 60% of that potash comes from two countries, um, uh, or from two areas, I should say. One is uh, Canada, and the other one is Russia and Belarus. And the way they've been operating, basically, uh, the three large uh, Canadian operators um, have, uh, sorry, I got, a, I got this uh, phone here bothering <laughs> us. Um, uh, they, have, uh, they have an overseas marketing arm. Um, basically, they have uh, an organization that sells potash outside of North America for these three organizations. And, and then the Russian, two Russian producers and one Belarusian producer, they also have uh, joint forces in one organization, one marketing arm, selling again uh, outside of Russia and Belarus. Mm -hmm. um, now, you can imagine it's a highly concentrated um, sector. In other words, 60% uh, is controlled by two groups. And, and then there are other producers, uh, as you mentioned, German producer, KNS is one of the largest producers, I think about 5 million tons. Then there are smaller producers worldwide, but they're not too many, about probably another half a dozen to a dozen, um, about a million, maximum two million tons uh, of production a year. The major importers, as you can imagine, are the, the countries with largest uh, population, such as China, India, uh, followed by countries like Brazil and Southeast Asia and so forth. Um, now, it's a good question as to with all these juniors coming online. Now, not all of these juniors will hit production for obvious reasons. Uh, the, the financing cost, uh, financing barrier is extremely high. So um, the, there is a chance that some of these will be absorbed by existing companies, meaning, for example, Potash One was bought by, uh, by KNS. And if you look at KNS's profile, for example, you will see that their German assets are aging. So it was a, a very logical step for them to get into Saskatchewan to basically maintain their production, uh, production level. Um, now, obviously, there will be more production coming online. As you, may, you might know, BHP is, uh, is in Ethiopia. They're in Saskatchewan. They're trying to build uh, large-scale operations. Um, but at the same time, the consumption of potash is growing, too. And uh, these two uh, Canadian and Russian organizations have been very disciplined in maintaining the price. So it's highly unlikely that anytime soon we'll see a dramatic drop in the price of potash. In fact, we see that been going up slowly, uh, but steadily. For example, uh, even I think this morning it was announced that uh, BPC, which is a Russian uh, organization or Belarusian slash Russian organization selling uh, overseas, 
they've increased the price of potash. And uh, one more thing before you transit into Germany, that, and it's very important for us, we're in a very unique position, meaning that the Chinese and Indians have been importing from the Russians and Canadians for decades. And they would love to see potash coming from somewhere else in addition to that. In other words, if we have to compete against uh, Saskatchewan or Russian-based production, I think the Chinese and Indians will prefer uh, potash from Africa. Okay. Okay, small <coughs> translation. Um, my Frage war eigentlich darum, wenn jetzt so viele uh, potash explorer uh, jetzt gute Arbeit leisten und dann auch in Produktion kommen, wird der Preis von potash nicht zusammenbrechen. Um, er, seiner Meinung nach ist es ganz einfach, um, es gibt zwei große Länderblocks, erstens mal Kanada und Russland, die die um, 60% des Marktes dominieren und uh, die größten Abnehmer liegen in Kinde, China und Indien. Um, es uh, ist so, dass... Kindien und China. China und <lacht> Indien. So, um, wenn die jetzt, die, erstens mal ist natürlich uh, gut, wenn China und Indien andere uh, Anbieter noch haben, außer diese zwei Länder. Und zweitens ist das so, auch die, die uh, Produktions- uh, ja, wenn man sich die Minen anschaut, so wie zum Beispiel Kali und Salz, die teilweise schon eine gewisse Alte erreicht haben und ihr Fördermaximum auch dementsprechend erreicht haben. Ähm, die Nachfrage steigt aufgrund dieser Länder äh, stetig an und deswegen erwartet er auch, wenn diese ähm, manche Explorer online gehen, wobei er davon ausgeht, dass die nicht alle in Produktion gehen werden, weil manche einfach nicht äh, die Finanzierung schaffen bzw. nicht übernommen werden, dann geht er trotzdem davon aus, dass der Preis für uh, Potash eigentlich kontinuierlich uh, steigen wird. One, one little question. What is at the moment the price for, for Potash and uh, do you have maybe some internal calculation? What is your price, what you can produce? Um, yeah, the, the two main uh, Potash products in the world that, uh, that is sold uh, by all these organizations that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one is called MOP, which is Myriad of Potash, and that's about 90% of the market. And then the, the other product, the smaller product, but a premium product, is called SOP, which is uh, Sulfate of Potash. Um, MOP is currently trading between, uh, between $400 and $425 per ton. And uh, as I said, the, the price is being increased by both the Russians and, and the Canadians. Um, the, uh, the SOP, normally depending on the uh, on the uh, you know, region of the world, depending on the uh, on the season of the year and so forth, it usually trades between 25 and 40 percent premium over uh, over MOP price. So uh, basically, between uh, 550 and 650 dollars per ton, um, which we will talk about as well, because our uh, our uh, deposit is very unique that it can actually help us with production SO, uh, of SOP at a lower cost. Um, now, in terms of the cost, we believe. Again, we've done internal estimates, and uh, and hopefully, again, we'll get uh, better better numbers later on this year. Uh, but our uh, our production cost will be about seventy dollars per ton, and uh, the transportation cost will be about thirty thirty five dollars per ton to the port, and uh, other costs, meaning you know the, the general and administrative costs, will be probably another ten to twenty dollars per ton. And again, that's kind of on the higher end, conservative end. So we're thinking 120 to 150 dollars maximum is going to be all-inclusive cost uh, per ton, uh, which leaves a very, very uh, large margin for us, I even if we sell only MLP, not SOP. Okay. Um, meine Frage ist, uh, was ist jetzt der allgemeine Potterspreis und uh, wie um, sind ungefähr seine Kosten nach der jetzigen Kalkulation? Also es gibt zwei große Produkte, das ist das MOP, das ist, äh, macht ungefähr 90 Prozent des Marktes aus, das kostet ungefähr 400 bis 420 Dollar pro Tonne und dann gibt es das SOP, ähm, das ist inzwischen je nach ähm, Jahreszeit zwischen 20 und 40 Prozent teurer, also zwischen 550 und 650 Tonnen. Die können ähm, auch SOP produzieren oder relativ viel SOP produzieren, eine Produktionskosten liegen ungefähr bei 70 Dollar, die Transportkosten liegen bei 30 bis 35 Dollar und die anderen Kosten, die dann dazukommen, das sind Transportkosten, Transport und so weiter. Äh, also in Summe werden sie auch irgendwo 120 bis 150 Dollar pro Tonne kommen, was natürlich bei einem Verkaufspreis, selbst bei niedrigen Produkten, eine riesen riesen Marge, Marge äh, übernimmt. Ja. Oh, du musst ein bisschen lauter sprechen. Echt? 
Bin ich so leise? Ja. Na ja, ein bisschen. Hm? Ein bisschen. Ja, okay, ja. ich werde mich versuchen zu, zu bessern, aber wie gesagt, kurz das Fazit, eine riesen Margin bleibt über. Also wie gesagt, einer Produktionskosten liegen irgendwo bei 120 bis 150 Dollar und äh, das billigste Produkt liegt zwischen 400 und 420 Dollar gekauft. So, it's a huge margin. So, it yeah. should not be a problem to finance this project. Uh, no, I think it's gonna be uh, relatively easier compared to you know many other product uh, projects. Uh, at the same time, it's still uh, it's still gonna require hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's still um, it's still gonna take quite a bit of work to finance it uh, because it's, uh, it's it's in Africa. There, there's obviously other risk. Uh, there are other risks involved. But generally speaking, I think we're in a much better shape uh, to take this to production than anyone else in the world. Uh, when we look at your chart, what, 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 what's here was a spike, here's a huge volume, a spike in the, in the share price. What, what's happened here in this chart? Um, uh, we actually, we had, as you can see here, uh, hold on, let me just get the pointer here. Um, as you can see, we had quite a bit of run uh, in the beginning of the year. And this was uh, coincidental with some of our uh, drill hole results as well as some other uh, positive developments in the sector. And, and then we had uh, what we call the, the fat finger problem or whatever it is in, in trading lingo. You guys may know <laughs> better. Um, but uh, there, was, uh, there was a number of orders entered uh, either uh, by mistake or, you know, maybe intentionally. We still don't know. The, uh, the, the exchange is investigating it. And suddenly, the, within two minutes, uh, there were a whole bunch of uh, – um, uh, limit orders, so uh, you know, the loss, uh, uh, you know, the loss limit orders triggered, which took the price down. Although the exchange came in and invalidated them, and wrote the price up to dollar seventy-five, uh, but still it affected us. As you can see, uh, you know, we've been in very uh, narrow range since then. Um, so the exchange is still investigating what happened there, but. Uh, but it unfortunately has happened to many other companies, both in uh, Toronto and Toronto Exchange and in New York. So it, it is some uh, some infrastructure problem that uh, both exchanges are looking into. Okay. Uh, but in the end, it was not the typical. Not that you published something. It was only a technical mark situation. Yeah. I, no, there was nothing. Uh, in fact, there were all actually very good news coming in, and the day. A day after this thing, I was even on uh, BNN, which is the, the business television here in in, uh, in Toronto in, in Canada, talking about the upcoming good results, uh, the drill hole results. So everything was positive, but this was a technical issue that unfortunately okay. brought the stock down a little bit. Okay. Man sieht, dass die Aktie extrem gut gelaufen ist. Das ist vor allem auch mit den ganzen Vorergebnissen und so weiter gewesen. Und natürlich auch, dass der Markt äh, sehr gut äh, gelaufen ist. Und hier hat es vor allem eine technische schon gegeben, dass da auch Schurfverkäufe drin waren, beziehungsweise Stop Loss äh, Orders ausgelöst worden sind. Und äh, da ist ein extremes Umsatzvolumen gewesen und dadurch ist das äh, gut zugekommen. Ja, but it's, it's look nice, the chart looks nice. Oh, And thank it you. Looks like yeah, you I, coming out to a break situation in the next yeah. few weeks. <laughs> perfect Hopefully entry point. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think it's a perfect entry point for, for, for collecting some shares. From the yeah, chart something situation. Something must happen in the next. Uh, maybe in two weeks, something must happen. Yeah, well, you're right because in the next two or three weeks, as I said, the uh, 43101 report is coming out, <coughs> and um, you know we've as you know we've drilled quite a few holes, and you may remember our original 43101 was based on historical holes, and it encompassed only about uh, seven percent of our uh, land position. And it was 105 million tons. So we believe the uh, 43101 that is upcoming will be much larger than 105 million tons. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> 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 so, then. Uh, okay. Yeah, please, okay. please go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. All right. So, a little bit about management. I want to. Oops. Maybe Oops. That's I, oh, oh. I think I, I <laughs> pressed something wrong. Uh, here we go. Here we go. It's now? too large. Uh, no, it's too large. Do you, yeah. Can you control it from your side, or you want me to do it? Uh, yeah, let me do it. Right. Yeah, uh, that's going okay. better. Better. Okay. Um, so, um, 
my background, you know, you, know, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned Potash One. I was one of the co-founders of Potash One. Um, so I, I, I have been in Potash business for quite a while now. Before that, I was um, uh, with a uranium company called Energy Metals. <clears throat> and we grew Energy Metals from uh, about $10 million in market cap and uh, sold it to Uranium One for $1.8 billion in about three years' time. Um, so I've been uh, in, in this exploration business for quite a while. Peter McLean is our senior VP of exploration, really a great guy uh, and uh, with, with fantastic experience. And he's been the key um, exploration um, the, the manager in this, uh, basically putting together, the, designing the entire exploration program. Um, Najib is our key man in Ethiopia. He's um, uh, Canadian of Ethiopian descent, so he's established really close relations with the Ethiopian government at all levels. And uh, Jack Scott just joined us. Uh, he's going to work on um, the project financing for, uh, for construction. And Jason has been uh, our uh, manager uh, on the ground there in Ethiopia, living in, in, the, uh, um, in our camp and basically managing all our operations in, the, uh, in Ethiopia. Um, <clears throat> and we, we think we have uh, one of the best boards uh, of directors in the, in the entire, uh, okay. yeah, this is better, uh, in the entire uh, junior sector. If you can take a look at this, we, uh, okay, is it, uh, should I, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let me just try this again. All right, that's better. Perfect. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at it, you'll see that we have Rick LaCroix, who used to be senior vice president of Potash Corporation of Saskatchewan, <coughs> basically was in, uh, in charge of all the operations there, An extremely knowledgeable guy about potash operations in general. Mark Stouffer, who used to be president of Potash and Phosphate Institute of Canada. Again, uh, he knows everything about the uh, end use of potash. And on the exploration side, we got a senior advisor, uh, two senior advisors. One is Steve Halabura. And then <clears throat> the main name to go to in uh, solution mining in Saskatchewan, and Robert Konecki used to be chairman of Potash Company of America, and also he was chairman of Campotex. So if you look at these guys, uh, you, you will see that what we've tried to achieve here is to uh, you know, cover the entire spectrum of operations from exploration all the way to, uh, to the distribution and use of potash. So these guys really had a lot of, uh, a lot of um, experience, a lot of, uh, a lot of help and expertise in our operations. Um, a little bit about Ethiopia. Uh, as you know, Ethiopia is in the northern, northeastern part of uh, Africa. This is probably one of the most stable countries in that part of Africa. Uh, it's been uh, developing very rapidly. It's, uh, it's been uh, in the top five countries in terms of its uh, GDP per capita growth. Um, they've, they've done a great job in stabilizing the country and uh, opening the doors for foreign direct investment. Um, they, uh, most recently, about a few years ago, they also revised their mining laws. That's why you have now large uh, companies um, exploring and developing various mining projects in Ethiopia. Besides Alana, for example, in, in that part of Ethiopia, Ethiopia, we have Yara, which is a large Norwegian fertilizer company also exploring for potash. We have BHP, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, they have a very large land position. They're also exploring for potash. There are many other companies now in other sectors of, uh, of uh, in other mining sectors in Ethiopia. And one other thing uh, before I go to the next slide here is that in terms of transparency and doing business in Ethiopia, it ranks higher than most of the BRIC countries, which is very important for a small, uh, small company like ours. Joe, you okay, want to um, let me the yeah. Explain a little bit about uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I think, um, yeah, when man überlegt uh, Ethiopien, uh, dann denkt man wahrscheinlich nicht unbedingt daran, dass das um, uh, gerade ein, ein stabiles Land ist. Uh, wie er auch erklärt hat, ist es einer der stabilsten Länder, wie man auch hier lesen kann, in einer der größten oder schnellst wachsenden um, Wirtschaften überhaupt. Um, und uh, sie haben auch ihr Minengesetz geändert und sind sehr freundlich, sehr westlich orientiert, uh, also minenfreundlich und sind auch also aktiv auf der Suche, sind neben... Uh, Joe, ja. <lacht> ich glaube, dass das ein sagen? ganz ein wichtiger Punkt ist, da, uh, dass uh, zum Beispiel man in Ethiopien Open uh, uh, bessere Sicherheit für sein Investment hat, weil, uh, Alana macht ja Investments praktisch in Äthiopien, als zum Beispiel in Russland, Brasilien ja. oder Indien. Ne? 
Ähm, ja, weil eins verstehe, okay, Russland ist klar, will ich auch nicht gerne investieren, aber mh. Brasilien und Indien ist schon überraschend. Mh, find ja, um, ja. Find ich ja. Ich finde das ist ja so. The, the ranking mm -hmm. from um, business uh, survival ranking about uh, uh, that um, Ethiopia is, is better than Russia, Brazil, and India. So yeah, uh, basically really this, this is doing business survey, meaning uh, in terms of the government transparency, um, in terms of the level of corruption uh, at okay. various levels of government, etc. So, um, and we've been there for over two years now. We've really had very good experience, very positive experience. Uh, um, the, there have been very open relationships with the government. Uh, it's a very straightforward licensing process. Uh, not only that, the government has uh, helped a lot with this project in terms of building infrastructure around the project as well. So uh, uh, doing business surveys, basically looking at, at private companies operating in certain countries in terms of transparency of the government and the corruption and so forth. Okay. Das ist interessant. Also es geht ja, wenn man das jetzt äh, vor allem mit der Korruption und so weiter äh, vergleicht, dann ist es äh, Äthiopien besser als wie Russland, Brasilien oder Indien. Also gerade was die Sicherheit des Investments betrifft. Um, do you have any experience, uh, how long normally take uh, um, uh, the time is uh, to bring, to get permits uh, for, for a mine? Mining permits? Yeah, yeah we we have uh, four licenses there uh, that encompass about 160 square kilometers. Three of those licenses are exploration licenses. One is a mining permit. Um, mm -hmm. and now, the way it works in Ethiopia, basically you put, put together a work program, exploration or a mine program, depending on what kind of permit you apply for, and you pay maintenance fees, and also you put the budget as to what you expe expect to spend. You submit it to the government, and the government reviews it. If they have any questions, they, they comment, etc. You have a back and forth with them. Um, but once uh, the, you know you go through this uh, comment period, basically they approve it. They grant the license to it. Usually it takes between two and three months. So it's it's not a very long process at all. Okay. Um, okay. This is a relative uh, and a straightforward uh, process. Um, here is a good point. Local infrastructure. This was my next question. Um, I can't believe that um, uh, Ethiopia had uh, the same infrastructure than a Western, Western oriented country. Um, is this a big problem? Uh, do you have exercise to, to power, to roads, to water, whatever you need that you can uh, have a mine? And, and maybe also yeah. you find people that can work there? So they have the, the uh, knowledge. So question. Finding people um, has n not been a problem there at all. Um, we do, in fact, use mostly Ethiopians there. Out of, uh, I think, only three people are expats, uh, two British uh, engineers, uh, uh, one British engineer, one uh, geologist, and also uh, one Canadian geologist. The rest are all Ethiopians. Ethiopia, relatively speaking, has a pretty good educational system. So geologists and mining engineers are of very good quality. They're quite competent. And there are also obviously other people who help us there with uh, you know various uh, engineering works and ge ge exploration and so forth. They're all Ethiopians, and uh, we've been very happy with them. I mean, they, they they've done a great job, and in fact, we've never had any issue with finding right skilled labor there. So in that respect, everything is good. In terms of an immediate infrastructure, um, you know, this is in the middle of desert. So there were two gravel roads coming to our property, or I should say, dirt roads. And one of them, and I'll uh, I'll go to the pointer here and show you. Maybe I can increase the size a little bit. Here you go. Um, so if you look at it, you will see that there are two roads. One, oops, one back again. But anyway, so one coming from the west, and the other one going uh, right here. Oops. Uh, <laughs> the other way around. What happened? <laughs> All right, here you go. So stop it. Works. So now it's good. Yeah. That's good. So uh, from the west, and the government actually rebuilt this road, turned into a gravel road uh, at their own cost. Now they're paving it, which is very important for us. So that means we can bring very heavy equipment uh, and, uh, and, and all the supplies later on, especially when the time comes for construction. And then there is another road going south, and uh, again, that, that road uh, is not being built now, but that may be revamped as well. So the key thing here is the government is rebuilding the road and also they're planning to build a, a direct a, a rail line coming from the port of Djibouti, as you can see here, and coming all the way, this, you see, the, coming mm -hmm. to our property. 
It will come first to Michaela, which is about 100 kilometers away. Uh, but that will not be done probably until four or five years from now. But once it's done, then we can even produce more potash than just one million tons a year. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, until then, we plan to produce about a million tons and uh, transport it on trucks. Okay. Uh, let me translate a little bit. So, also, here in this Bereich hat die, der, der Staat selber jetzt eine, eine Straße, auch wenn es nur eine Schotterstraße ist, jetzt gebaut. Damit ist, ist es möglich, dass sie dementsprechend deutlich äh, schwereres Equipment reinbringen können. Ähm, dann ist das Problem, dass ähm, äh, die, die Ausbildung der Leute sehr gut ist. Sie haben nur drei Personen, die nicht Äthiopier sind. Uh, und bei ihrem Staff als andere sind die Äthiopier und sie sind eigentlich sehr zufrieden mit denen, wie es uh, dort ist. Uh, es gibt eine Eisenbahnlinie, jetzt man sieht hier die Eisenbahnlinie, die führt direkt hier uh, zu diesem Port, der auch uh, notwendig ist, um, um uh, uh, ihr, ihr Portage zu verschiffen. Es wird jetzt eine zweite Linie gebaut, wenn dies möglich ist, dann können sie auch ihre Produktionszahlen erhöhen. Momentan ist geplant, dass eine Million uh, Tonnen pro Jahr uh, produziert wird. Okay, it's now it's a little bit small, so but we can go forward. <laughs> yes, too right. small, yeah. And now <laughs> it's a little bit large, but good, stop, stop okay, it. Okay, that's good, that's good. All right. Okay, so this one uh, is our historical inferred mineral resource. Uh, in other words, this is the resource that was compiled about two years ago by Erkus Plan, the German engineering company I mentioned. And Erkus Plan has been in business for a long time, since the 1940s. They've done a lot of work for KNS, um, uh, for Russian producers, for Vale in Brazil, for, uh, for Saskatchewan-based producers. And they're much familiar with, with uh, Africa and Ethiopia in particular. So they've come up with this uh, 105 million tons of inferred resource about two years ago, based on only about 7% of our property. Uh, at that time, it gave us a very good indication that there's a huge upside potential. And since then, as I mentioned earlier, we've drilled about 20 holes. And the new 43-101 report will be coming up in two or three, uh, two, three weeks, which will be um, okay. substantially bigger than this one. Okay. Um, this is the, what we are seeing is a historic uh, schätzung. These 105 million tonnen come from uh, Erkoplan, this is a Dutch uh, firma. Um, this, wie gesagt, is historic. They come in two weeks with a uh, new schätzung. In the zwischenzeit haben sie 20 Vorlöcher gebohrt, die uh, sehr erfolgreich waren, and they gehen davon aus, that they diese Tonnage deutlich erhöhen können. Uh, okay. If I remember right, this was from seven holes. Uh, seven uh, yeah, percent of the project. Seven oh. percent of the property, but you're right, it was about uh, 16 holes. 16 okay. holes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we can we can expect a, a, a double in, in resource, or was there some infill drilling? Um, I, I think uh, it will be at least double, uh, but most likely more than double. Okay. Okay. okay this, this comes from 16 Bohrlöcher, and this betrifft aber nur 7 percent des ganzen Projektes. Also, man könnte theoretisch mit einer Verdoppelung des der der Ressource oder sowas rechnen. Okay. Okay. You now, one thing before we leave this uh, uh, slide, I don't know why this is jumping, but uh, <laughs> are we doing both or uh, just me trying to do something there? Okay, here we go. Oops. Um, now, one other thing here is that you, you remember I mentioned S MOP and SOP. Uh, Maybe you use your wheel. Do you use your wheel on the, on the, on the computer mouse? Um, no, I'm not, but I don't know. I'm trying to just get this and leave it alone. Here we go. Okay. Well, let's leave it alone. So that I, no, I'm not doing anything now. All right. So, I don't know why, but... Okay, so, so wait, the S... I will, why, why don't you do I don't it? I don't know why it it's going... So, I will do it larger. Why it's going... You know what? I think it's yours that is uh, rolling away, isn't it? I have a wheel, but I don't use it. <laughs> okay, oh, no, it's yeah, I'm not my it. <laughs> <laughs> So here you can see the uh, uh, we were talking about MOP and SOP. Remember, I said SOP mm -hmm. usually trades at a higher price, and now uh, yes. we have about 50, 60, potential 70 percent of our potash in in a mineral mineral called kainite or kainitite. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. it has sulfate in it, which means that we can actually use canitide to produce SOP at potential lower cost than regular SOP production, ah, which means okay. that probably 70% of our production may be in SOP. So our revenues may be significantly higher than a typical MOP production. Okay, that's very and That will have a completely different impact on our financial model. Okay. Um, wir sehen hier, dass ungefähr 70 Prozent des äh, Kainite ähm, äh, Potash ist und das kann genutzt werden, um das SOP zu, ähm, zu produzieren, das deutlich äh, höherpreisig ist als das MOP. Ähm, und von daher äh, erwarten Sie sich auch, dass Sie einen deutlich höheren ähm, Ertrag machen können. Okay. Okay. Now, here uh, I try to encapsulate all the major advantages that we have over many other projects in the world, especially in Saskatchewan, Brazil, or Russia. And one of the key uh, differences is, that, of course, shallow depth. Uh, I mentioned earlier, many other places in the world, they go down 500 to 2,000 meters. Um, now, this allows us to actually think about both open pit and solution mining. Um, now, if it's a solution mine, we have a huge advantage over many other parts of the world again and not only because of shallow depth, but also because of the climate. It's a very hot, very dry uh, area here in, in this part of Ethiopia. We're talking about 40 to 45 degrees Celsius year-round, very dry, which means we can use solar evaporation ponds. Now, why this is important? In a typical um, solution mining operation, let's say in Saskatchewan, you would um, pump the water into your ore body, you would dissolve potash, bring the slurry back up, then you have to evaporate water from and separate KCL. In Saskatchewan, it's very cold, as you can imagine, in winter, very humid <laughs> in summer, so you cannot use solar evaporation pond. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. You buy very expensive uh, thermal evaporation plants, and you push the product through mm -hmm. there. Your energy costs go higher. Obviously, your capex is higher because of this unit itself. In the case of Ethiopia, what we do, first of all, we don't have to drill that deep, as, as you can see. Uh, so our drilling and piping costs are going to be lower, significantly lower than in Saskatchewan or in Brazil. And then what do you do once the slurry is back up to, uh, at surface? Uh, instead of putting this through a thermal evaporation plant, we just put them in solar evaporation ponds and let the nature do its work. Uh, once uh, the water is dried up, you just harvest potash and go through processing. So that will allow us significant savings on energy costs. And I'll give you one example. Uh, where they're doing this. Uh, by the way, they do this in ma many parts of the world where the climate permits, such as uh, China, Israel, uh, um, Chile, and uh, also in, um, uh, in Utah, uh, in the United States. And in Utah, for example, they produce in one of these production centers, they produce 250,000 tons of potash. By using solar evaporation ponds, they save on 400,000 tons of coal. So there are huge energy savings right there. And a couple of other things, as you can imagine, the, the labor costs in, in Ethiopia are much lower than in, in Saskatchewan or, or Russia or, or Brazil. And, and also um, a very important other advantage here, in Saskatchewan, uh, many juniors, even if they do find two, three billion dollars to develop this project, they still have to find <coughs> logistic routes out of Saskatchewan. In other words, how to take it to, uh, to the West Coast. And most of these, uh, you know, routes, uh, railway, uh, port facilities are controlled by Campotex. And Campotex is the uh, overseas ar marketing arm for three Canadian producers. So they have to either compete with Campotex or become part of Campotex. In our case, we don't have that situation, which is a major advantage because it doesn't really limit us in any way. Okay? So, um, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Do you have a show? So, man kann ja nicht verstehen, du musst das Mikrofon einstellen, ein, einschalten. So. <lacht> Aber ich probiere es. Äh, nein, nein, ich bin schon wieder da. Ich habe ein, ein kleines technisches okay. Issue gehabt. Ich war okay. mal wieder offline. Okay. Ähm, ja, ich probiere es aber trotzdem, das, was ich verstanden habe, nur schon mal zu übersetzen. Also hier sind jetzt einmal die größten Vorteile von, von der Alanas Projekte gegenüber den anderen. Erstens mal, wie wir gesagt haben, es ist oberflächenlang, nur 100 bis 250, 300 Meter tief, die anderen gehen auf 500 bis 2000 Meter tief. Ähm, Erna ist die Möglichkeit, Open Pit und Solution Mining zu machen. Ähm, die anderen müssen großes Underground Mining machen. Der nächste große Vorteil ist dadurch, dass es dort so heiß ist, brauchen sie nicht unbedingt jetzt ähm, eine, eine, ja, eine, eine Anlage bauen, die 
beim Solution ähm, die, das Wasser wieder verdampft. In der Regel wird es so gemacht, Wasser wird reingepumpt, das löst das Kaliumchlorid aus dem äh, Gestein raus, wird wieder aufgepumpt und dort wird es dehydriert, also das heißt, dass das Wasser entzieht. Äh, man weiß es auch bei der normalen Salzgewinnung. Äh, und dort ähm, braucht man das Gut des Lichts, weil dort einfach so heiß ist, dass das Wasser auch von, von selber im Prinzip verdampft. Äh, das ergibt natürlich deutlich niedrigere Kosten. Ähm, es ist sehr schnell in Produktion zu gehen, weil die, die Kernnetze, also die Genehmigung für die Produktion früher kommt. Und was auch ein großer Positivum ist, sie müssen nicht mit Kampfertex dealen, denn wenn jetzt einer zum Beispiel in Saskatchewan, also in Kanada ist, dann ähm, hat man keine Kapazitäten ähm, im Hafen. Die werden nämlich kontrolliert nämlich von äh, Campotex. Entweder man muss daher in Kompetenz, also in, in Competition treten, also in Konkurrenzkampf treten mit Campotex, oder man muss Part von Campotex werden. Und Campotex wird von den großen drei Produzenten kontrolliert. So, ich hoffe, da habe ich jetzt nichts vergessen. Nichts Wesentliches. Perfekt, Joe. Ja, super. Perfekt. Okay. Next slide. All right, great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so briefly on this slide, we talked about it initially, but uh, the, the, as soon as we saw that this is a very strong project and the potential low cost, we decided that we're going to start working on getting strong finan financial partners to help us not only at this stage, but most importantly at the construction stage. And as you can see from this slide, um, the IFC came in, uh, again, International Finance Corporation with $10 million investment in the company. Again, we became the only potash project in the world with a stamp of approval of World Bank Group. IFC is, as you know, the, the, is the largest developmental organization in the world. They invested $18 billion in private companies uh, last year alone. And we also have received $20 million of direct investment from Liberty Mining and Metals. They hold about 17% of Alana, and they're also committed uh, to helping us with uh, financing of the construction stage. Um, again, this really differentiates us with, uh, from any other potash project in the world right now. Okay. Um, um, and here, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we've been um, talking um, about the, the finances thing, so uh, on the short uh, uh, remind, so, yes. wie gesagt, die zwei großen Company finanzieren, IFC uh, ist auch Teil der Weltbank, die hat letztes Jahr insgesamt 18 uh, Milliarden überhaupt uh, privat uh, finanziert. Um, uh, und die LMM-Gruppe, die gehört momentan 17 Prozent von Alana und die haben sie auch dementsprechend committed, dass uh, wenn es zu, zu einem Konstruktionsstadion uh, kommt, dass sie ihnen helfen. Okay. All right, and here, uh, this is again the, uh, the summary of what we've done so far technically there in the exploration program. We've drilled uh, over 20 holes. We've also done 2D seismic survey of about 48 kilometers. Uh, we've drilled for water, and we've also started environmental baseline studies in preparation for bankable feasibility studies. Um, we have a full equipped state of the art our camp there, we've, uh, we have new roads, so it's come, uh, it's come along a long way. And we've also drilled some water wells, and you can see there, Helmut is pointing at it. Uh, there is a healthy water rates there, extremely good water flows of 600 gallons per minute, which means that we can actually do solution mining. Okay. Um, okay, here's your, your what would you, you tell me before you drill only the, no, no, go to the slide. But the next slide. Um, you say you drill um, only seven percent of your, or the, the historical drills was only seven percent. No, of his, of, his uh, historical was on seven percent. Now we drilled about half of the property, okay. and so the four three one oh one will come out on about that western half. As you can see on this map, it shows the the location of the drill holes and the uh, the blue dots.